Hello, I'm Annette Young and welcome to the 51 per cent, a show about women reshaping our world. Coming up, furious debate here in France over actor Gerard Depardieu, who's facing allegations of rape after a letter of support by well-known figures in the film industry and President Emmanuel Macron saying he didn't support a manhunt. Thousands have signed a petition decrying the president's and others' remarks as being sexist. Also, following a turbulent year on the world stage in 2023, the United Nations role has become even more important. But the global body has never had a female Secretary General. I'll be talking to Susanna Malcora, the former Argentinian Foreign Minister, who, with others, is campaigning for a woman to be appointed to the job in 2026. And in Cambodia, their numbers may be tiny, but a growing number of female tuk-tuk drivers are making an impression on both locals and tourists alike. And welcome to our very first show for 2024. We begin with the fall of French cinema giant Gérard Depardieu. The iconic actor these days is facing accusations of rape and sexual harassment. The film industry is divided over the scandal and a number of well-known figures have defended the actor, including President Macron. But three anti-Depardieu petitions have been signed by thousands of people. France divided over the Depardieu scandal. The cinema icon is accused of sexual violence over two decades. Gérard Depardieu, an Oscar-nominated actor, denies any wrongdoing. But a TV programme recently showed him on a trip to North Korea in 2018, making explicit sexual comments and sexualising a young girl riding a horse. The French culture minister immediately reacted. What shocks me in that report are the comments made by Gérard Depardieu with a provocative tone. He's joking and yet what he's saying is extremely serious and incredibly violent. A few days later, President Macron insisted the 75-year-old was innocent until proven guilty. There's one thing you'll never see me do, that's participate in a manhunt. I hate that. In an open letter, around 60 French celebrities declared their support for Depardieu. But many have since regretted it. Thousands more people signed three petitions against him, saying art is not a totem of impunity. In recent years, an increasing number of scandals have rocked France. The Strauss-Kahn case and the Me Too movement encouraged women to make their voices heard. Not a week goes by without a mention here or there in the media of a sexual offence committed by someone. Usually the victims speak out. It's like a tsunami. The movement itself is a tsunami, and this is just the beginning of a long and slow process. It's forcing us, particularly men, to reconsider the way they're behaving. According to official figures, there are around 100,000 victims of rape every year in France. Less than 1% of the cases end up with a conviction. Now, in 2025, the United Nations will mark its 80th birthday and also eight decades without ever having a woman at its helm. But there's now a growing push for the next UN Secretary General to be a woman when Antonio Guterres finishes his term in 2026. Susanna Malcora, a former Argentinian foreign minister and former chief of staff to the UN Secretary General, is the president and co-founder of Global Women Leaders Voices, which is campaigning for the UN to elect its first ever female to the position at the next vote. She joins me now from Madrid. Susanna, thank you so much for your time. What has been the impact on the world in general by not ever having a woman as a UN Secretary General? Well, I will say is the impact of not having women fully represented in all its spheres of power. The United Nations is a significant uh, place of power. It has a, an influence and it has an importance in large geopolitics, in peace and security, in development, in humanitarian, in human rights. And not having a woman at the helm means having only a partial perspective on how to handle all those issues. And this is particularly true in the case of the world in 2024. And you said it at the beginning, things are so dire, the complexity of the issues are such 
that we need somebody approaching the solutions from a different view, from a different perspective. Back in 2016, you were quoted as saying that within the UN, and particularly the UN Security Council, when it came to gender equality, it wasn't so much a glass ceiling, but a steel ceiling. What did you mean by that? Well, it, you know, last time it, it, when there was a selection process and, and, and our good friend and colleague Antonio Guterres was selected, there were seven women competing for that position. And it was the case that everybody said it would, it's time for a woman to, to be at the helm. And out of seven, none of us were good enough to be secretary general. So it's hard to understand unless you believe that it's much stronger than a crystal ceiling, the one we have above us. Some might argue that the appointment of a woman to the job could be seen merely as a token gesture, that the need for gender equality within the UN itself goes much deeper than just having a woman at the top. That's true. You, having the woman heading the institution is only one part of it, but not having a woman for 80 years is a significant signal. So we believe that leadership matters. So having a woman at the helm of the UN, having a woman at the General Assembly, as a president of the General Assembly, only four times in 78 years, a woman led this General Assembly. That has significance, has value, has meaning. It represents something to the world. Of course, you have to go beyond that. You have to have fully a, a parity in the teams. You have to have an approach to policies that has a feminist perspective. It's a much broader question, but this is sort of a prerequisite to go that much farther and that much deeper. Susanna, who are the likely female candidates in 2026? Well, uh, you know, there is a, a regional rotation in the United Nations, and the time is for Latin America and the Caribbean. Well, you show some of the women that could make it there. You know, we have former president of Chile, Michelle Bachelet, uh, the prime minister of Barbados, uh, 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 Mia Motley, we have the former vice president of Costa Rica and current head of UNTAD, uh, Rebecca Greenspan. We have the former president of the General Assembly, uh, who is at the bottom, uh, Maria Fernanda Espinosa. We have at the left, the current foreign minister of Mexico and former head of CELAC. These are women of a weight and a, a projection that shows to you that at least in my region, that should be the one putting forward names, we have a good pool from to choose, and I'm not being exhausted here. So what are the odds of a woman actually getting the job the next time around? 100%. We just don't say any longer he or she, which is politically correct. We only speak about Madame Secretary General. There is no space to even consider that this is not going to happen. We just must make this a reality. For United Nations of the 21st century, for United Nations that addresses the shortcomings of this world, the, the multiple issues in terms of peace and security, in terms of development, equal opportunities, human rights, we need a woman there and the world needs a woman and that's what it is. So we cannot leave a space to doubt that the next Secretary General is going to be a woman. But I imagine you're going to experience some pushback, surely. Well, no doubt about it. But, you know, it's, it's just amazing that there is even a question that why should be a woman? Why do we have to think about a woman after 80 years? So the reason why you and I are, and I are speaking here is because we need to rally behind this notion. And... Again, it's no tokenism, it's no symbolism. It's making sure that we put half of the population, the 51% that you referred to, at the center of the global scene, which is the United Nations. And then we'll see what ideas come, what new things flourish, how we approach solutions in a manner that hopefully will address the difficult situation in which the world is today. 
Susanna Malcora, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity and thanks to your audience for supporting us. And finally, to Cambodia, where the push for equality is now extended to the country's tuk-tuk drivers. An association has been set up to help women enter the male-dominated field, as this report shows. She's called the tuk-tuk lady. Kim Sok Liang started driving 10 years ago. After her divorce, she needed to bring food to the table for her two sons. At first, she didn't get any passengers. Locals didn't trust her. Discrimination against Cambodian women still exists. People think that women are too weak to use steering wheels and that women cannot work like men. Kim then decided to target foreign tourists in Angkor, Cambodia's number one attraction, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Many women have since joined her in this male-dominated job. Most have been bullied, harassed or even assaulted when competing for fares. The road to gender equality is bumpy. As a woman, I found it hard to accept myself as a tuk-tuk driver. I never thought I could do it. I'm quite successful now and these men know that I'm strong, so they accept me. And their perseverance has paid off. Some customers prefer female drivers. They're really passionate about what they do and that they really enjoy it. All are clean and with I love the flags compared to some other tuk-tuks that you might like use and see. Cambodia's tuk-tuk ladies are determined to seek paid work instead of staying at home as expected in this largely patriarchal society. And that's it for now. We'd love to hear from you, so do reach out to us via Facebook, Instagram or X, of course, formerly known as Twitter. So until our next show, bye for now.